بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا ابن رسول الله السلام عليك يا ابن أمير المؤمنين وابن سيد الوصيين السلام عليك يا ابن فاطمة سيدة نساء العالمين السلام عليك يا ثار الله وابن ثاره والوتر الموتور السلام عليك وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليكم مني جميعا سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار يا أبا عبد الله لقد عظمت الرزية وجلت وعظمت المصيبة بك علينا وعلى جميع أهل الإسلام وجلت وعظمت مصيبتك في السماوات على جميع أهل السماوات فلعن الله أمة أسست أساس الظلم والجور عليكم أهل البيت ولعن الله أمة دفعتكم عن مقامكم وأزالتكم عن مراتبكم التي رتبكم الله فيها ولعن الله أمة غتلتكم ولعن الله الممهدين لهم بالتمكين من غتالكم برئت إلى الله وإليكم منهم وأشياعهم وأتباعهم لمن سالمكم وحرب لمن حاربكم إلى يوم القيامة ولعن الله آل زياد وآل مروان ولعن الله بني أمية خاطبة ولعن الله ابن مرجانة ولعن الله عمر بن سعد ولعن الله شبرا ولعن الله أمة أسرجت وألجمت وتنقبت لغتالك بأبي أنت وأمي لقد عظم مصابي بك فأسأل الله الذي أكرم مقامك وأكرمني أن يرزقني طلب ثارك مع إمام منصور من أهل بيت محمد صلى الله عليه وآله اللهم اجعلني عندك وجيها بالحسين عليه السلام في الدنيا والآخرة يا أبا عبد الله إني أتقرب إلى الله وإلى رسوله وإلى أمير المؤمنين وإلى فاطمة وإلى الحسن وإليك بمبالاتك وبالبراءة ممن أسس أساس ذلك وبنى عليه بنيانا وجرى في ظلمه وجوره عليكم وعلى أشياعكم برئت إلى الله وإليكم منهم وأتغرب إلى الله ثم إليكم بمبالاتكم ومبالات وليكم وبالبراءة من أعدائكم والناصبين لكم الحرب 
وبالبراءة من أشياعه وأتباعه إني سلم لمن سالمكم وحرب لمن حاربكم وولي لمن والاكم وعدو لمن عاداكم فأسأل الله الذي أكرمني بمعرفتكم ومعرفة أهليائكم ورزقني البراءة من أعدائكم أن يجعلني معكم في الدنيا والآخرة وأن يثبت لي عندكم قدم صدق في الدنيا والآخرة وأسأله أن يبلغني المقام المحمود لكم عند الله وأن يرزقني طلب ثاري مع إمام هدى ظاهر ناطق بالحق منكم وأسأل الله بحقكم وبالشأن الذي لكم عنده أن يعطيني بمصابي بكم أفضل ما يعطي مصابا بمصيبته مصيبة ما أعظمها وأعظم رزيتها في الإسلام وفي جميع السماوات والآن اللهم اجعلني في مقامي هذا ممن تناله منك صلوات ورحمة ومغفرة اللهم اجعل محيا يا محيا محمد وآل محمد ومماتي ممات محمد وآل محمد اللهم إن هذا يوم تبركت به بنو أمية وابن آكلة الأكباد اللعين ابن اللعين على لسانك ولسان نبيك صلى الله عليه وآله في كل موطن وموقف وغف فيه نبيك صلى الله عليه وآله اللهم العن أبا سفيان ومعاوية ويزيد بن معاوية عليهم منك اللعنة أبد الآبدين وهذا يوم فرحت به آل زياد وآل مروان بقتلهم الحسين صلوات الله عليه اللهم فضاعف عليهم اللعن منك والعذاب اللهم إني أتقرب إليك في هذا اليوم وفي موقفي هذا وأيام حياتي بالبراءة منهم واللعنة عليهم وبالموالاة لنبيك وآل نبيك عليه وعليهم السلام اللهم العن أول ظالم ظلم حق محمد وآل محمد وآخر تابع له على ذلك اللهم العن العصابة التي جاهدت الحسن وشايعت وبايعت وتابعت على قتله اللهم العنهم جميعا السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بثنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين اللهم خص أنت أول ظالم باللعن مني وابدأ به أولا ثم الثاني والثالث والرابع اللهم العن يزيد خامصا والعن عبيد الله بن زياد وابن مرجان وعمر بن سعد وشبرا
سورة المباركة الفاتحة الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبو القاسم محمد I begin in Allah's name and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Rum, the 30th chapter of the Quran. Allah says, فَأَقِمْ وَجَكَ لِلدِّينِ الْقَيِّمِ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَ يَوْمٌ لَا مَرَدَّ لَهُ مِنَ اللَّهِ يَوْمَئِذٍ يَصَّدَّعُونَ مَنْ كَفَرَ فَعَلَيْهِ كُفْرُ وَمَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَلِأَنفُسِهِمْ يمهدون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوة على محمد وآل محمد All praise belongs to Allah and I thank Him for granting us this opportunity to exist, to represent Him and to be witnesses in time, in history that a great sacrifice has taken place and to be party to a group of leaders that Allah has chosen, purified from Adam all the way to Imam Sahib al-Zaman, ajallahu ta'ala faraja as our leaders, as our guides when Allah says, وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفًا when Allah decreed it to the angels and said, I will place on earth my representative Khalifa here, جَاعِلٌ is constant meaning the Khalifa is not only one time Every second on earth there is a Khalifatullah and maybe more than one as some prophets were khalifa, you know, Khulafa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala simultaneously. But the leadership of Allah on earth is never bereft on earth. There is never a time. And our Prophet has stated that if there are two people left on earth, one will be the Khalifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that is incumbent. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates, He guides and without guidance, our purpose of existence is nullified. And therefore, it's only logical and rational that the agent of God, who is the witness and the guide for humanity, is always present. So I bear witness, there is no God but Allah. And the Holy Prophet is his last messenger. And Allah sent 124,000 prophets, Adam being the first one. For Adam was not only the first human being, but the first prophet. And by the way, this is unique in the Abrahamic faiths that among the Judeo-Christian Islamic groups were the only ones who say Adam was not only the first human being but was also the first prophet of God which is crucial and critical to understand the dynamics of how the Almighty works in that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts the first human being as his agency to ensure that no human being lives on this earth even for a millisecond without guidance to use the analogy if you want to use the metaphor though it's not a perfect metaphor but to use the analogy in today's world, we have GPS, what we say, satellite-guided systems. And we find that we have coordinates, and you have a system that figures out where to go. And logically, we would enter the address before we start driving. In other words, you don't drive and then in the middle enter the address, because you may go in the wrong direction for a small period of time and waste your life. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has planted the coordinates of goals even before mankind was created. That is why the Holy Prophet said, before Adam, I was there. And the reason was that because his nur, which was created, was created entirely for the purpose of being a guide for the human race. And that is why when we go to a higher stage, you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, SubhanAllah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, He created, خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ بِالْحَقِّ He created the skies and earth in truth. And you will find there is no objective in life more dear to us all on earth than to 
expose and submit to the truth. Whatever is the truth, haq, truth. You find every human being loves truth and lies are detested. So when we examine history, we find that, you know, in Hadith al-Kisa, when Jibreel comes and speaks to the Prophet, when he brings the eye of Tathir, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنِّي مَا خَلَقْتُ سَمَاءً مَبْنِيًّا وَلَا عَرْضًا مَدْحِيًّا وَلَا قَمَرًا مُنِيرًا وَلَا شَمْسًا مَضِيًّا وَلَا فَلَكًا يَدُورٍ وَلَا بَحْرٍ Right? إِلَّا فِي مَحَبَّةِ هَؤُلَاءِ الْخَمْسَةِ الَّذِينَ هُمْ تَحْتَ الْكِسَى We did not create this except for the love of these five in the kisa. Now you and I may think, how is that possible? This universe is so grand, so vast. And there are so many other creations in the universe besides mankind. And the prophets and the imams are leaders for humanity, particularly for humans, maybe for jinns too, but for humans specifically. How could it be that God created this spectacular universe just for the love of these five? Simple example and you'll see where this is going. You will see that nothing is more pervasive in the universe than truth. Truth is pervasive, meaning it's ubiquitous. We use the word ubiquitous, meaning it's everywhere. And it's pervasive. You cannot escape the power of truth. So if you ever watch sci-fi movies, and you end up on the other side of the universe, and you see aliens of all kinds, we still apply moral principles on those aliens. And the aliens still apply those moral principles on us. What is that? Well, is that alien a good one? An evil one or a good one? You notice that the universal principle of truth versus falsehood is universal, meaning there is not a place in the dominion of God's creation that is outside of the principles of truth versus falsehood. Please understand that. The moral argument is universal. It's not earthly. If we left earth and we went to another planet, our laws of morality will not change. Assuming we went as a small contingent group and went to Mars to live on Mars, we cannot say, well, the laws of Earth, we left it on Earth, we're going to now apply the laws of Mars. The physical laws of Mars we will apply, but the moral laws are universal regardless of where we lie. So when Allah says, in Nima khalaqtu sama'am mabniya, we did not create the sky and this Earth, qamaram munir, you see? meaning the, the, the reflective moon. See, shamsan mudi, falakin yadur, bahrin yajir, all of this, the skies, the earth, the seas, the mountains, except for the love of this five, what Allah is saying, that they are the representatives on earth of truth for truth, with truth, by truth, in truth. And Allah created the universe in truth. So when you and I submit to the truth 100%, then we're giving meaning to the existence of the universe. And Allah is saying, I created this also for the love of you. Because the minute you're completely subservient to the truth, then you become the reason, the raison d'etre, as they say, as to why the world and the universe exists. Interesting, you find in the battle of Safin, a man comes to Imam Ali salam and says, that man, Muawiyah, calls himself Amir al-Mu'minin. And you say you're Amir al-Mu'minin. Who is right? You two both are claiming to be Muslims. Who is right? Imam Ali salam says, go and ask Ammar. Ammar is the most honest, one of the most trustworthy companions of the Prophet. Go ask him, he will answer you. And the famous statement of Ammar, universally accepted by all schools of thought, is Ammar said, Ali ma'al haq wa haq ma'ali. Notice, Ali is with truth and truth is with Ali. Now put these two together when Allah says, illa fi mahabbati awla al khamsati ladina hum taht al kisa, you understand that what they're meaning is they're representing the ultimate truth. And Allah says, I created the universe in truth. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. It's very profound when you and I understand that from a pragmatic position that our objective were we to claim that we love Allah and we love the Prophet and we love Islam and we love Ahlul Bayt, then we must submit to the truth. If you claim to love Allah, then obey me, the Prophet says. Then God will love you and forgive you and protect you. So it is an objective 
for you and I not to give lip service within our religions by which to say I'm a believer. Karbala took place because there was too much lip service, not enough action and transaction. Our prophets and imams, when they were sent to mankind, all of them suffered. Every one of them suffered. Why? At the hands of people who gave lip service. Imam Ali alayhi salam gives a beautiful hadith. He said, people's religion are on their tongues and they will service it and submit to it as long as they have material benefits with it. But if they are tested and tried, they abandon it and run and the true believers are left as few. Classic example of Karbala, classic. Our commemoration of this great event is proof positive. Lakinna أكثر الناس لا يعقلون. Most of mankind has no aql. Now, when I say this, don't take it negatively, please. Understand that we have an obligation to eradicate this problem. We have an obligation to remove this bad statistic. Let us not simply, you know, become paralyzed and say, oh, well, since God has said it, then this is the decree, so there is nothing you and I can do by which to change societies for the positive. No. You and I are going to say that when the Prophet will complain on Judgment Day, when he will say, Ya Rabbi, inna qawmi takhadu hadha al-Qur'ana mahajura, my Lord, my community has ignored this Qur'an, then you and I must say, A'udhu billah, that I will not be in this complaint. I will not be in this statistic. That when my messenger complains on Judgment Day, which he will, God forbid I'm one of them. Therefore, I will indulge my life in Qur'an. For if that is the gift of God, which it is, then shame on me if I don't. That's an obligation. When we see a lot of kufr around, and the world is good, people are good, holistically human beings are very good. Believe me, majority of the human beings are good, including atheists. They're good people. They have a conscience. But sadly, we are not articulating the message of God within our actions and transactions, nor are we speaking legibly nor logically to invite people the way Allah says, Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikma wal maw'idatil hasana wa jadilhum billati hiya ahsan. Invite them to the way of your Lord. Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikma with wisdom. Wa jadilhum billati and make argumentation which is good don't be condescending don't insult them don't use ad hominems don't condemn them don't condemn anyone to hell you see bil hikma wal mawidatil hasana with wisdom and kind exhortation karbala was like that our imam was constantly speaking to the enemy constant he never stopped. He said, you've invited me. Do you know what you're doing? You know how wrong you are. Don't you remember the Prophet saying such and such? Do you not see what's in the Quran? Imam Zainul Abideen, after he's chained and he's entering the Mishk in the bazaar of Sham, and people are taunting him, one old man comes to him and says, good, our Khalifa has killed you and crushed your father. Imam looks at him and says, do you know who we are? He says, you are challenges of our Khalifa. He said, have you read the Quran? He said, yes. He says, I read the Quran. He says, have you read? He said, yes. He said, who is Qurba if not me? If not my family, these that you have seen in chains today, in tattered clothes. If it's not them, who is the Quran talking about? Hmm? And, the, and Imam salam, is constantly reiterating verse after verse about the Fadail, you know, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّدْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ That we have purified you, Ahl al-Bayt. He says, who is Ahl al-Bayt purified if not us? This old man began to shake and realize how ignorant he was. But look, بِالْحِكْمَةِ وَالْمَوْعِدَةِ الْحَسَنَةِ The Imam did not taunt him. He woke him up and told him, okay, you've been misinformed. You have taken the wrong side thinking that's good. When in fact, we are the good. But shaitan says, I will obfuscate that message. I am going to blur it. I'm going to mar it. I'm going to take people away from the truth. But what did the imam do? Bil hikmah. The question you and I must ask ourselves is what is our obligation? In the, fact, in the sense that we are Muslims, blessed. Many times people ask me, brother, I was born a Muslim. It wasn't a choice I made. But there are millions 
billions of Christians out there, Hindus, Jews, atheists, agnostics, Buddhists, who don't believe in Islam, what will happen to them? I said, do you consider yourself privileged that you were born a Muslim? He said, yes. I said, but it's not enough. No. See, Allah says, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمُ اتَّبِعُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ قَالُوا بَلْ نَتَّبِعُوا مَا وَجَدْنَا عَلَيْهِ آبَاءَنَا When they are told, follow what God has revealed, they say, no, we follow what our fathers followed. Now, many of us in Islam follow because our fathers followed it, with all due respect. Alhamdulillah, this is the true religion, without any hesitation. Alhamdulillah, that we have been born in the right deen. Alhamdulillah. But not everyone is privileged. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, okay, so I privileged you. I gave you the honor of having a system by which you will commemorate, you will remember Ahlul Bayt. I have given you a system by which to love Ahlul Bayt. I've given you a system by which to understand the inner depths of the Quran, which the average Muslim population cannot understand. And I, be, I have privileged you with the finest role models on earth that your agencies, your imams, their akhlaq is second to none. What are you going to do about it? Sadly, I see within our own schools, people who praise and cry for Imam Hussein, but we fight, we bicker, we gossip, we backbite, we find faults, we do haram things. And then we're saying, but we have the best religion. But what about that one who doesn't have the best religion? You think God will punish them? Hmm? You know who Allah is, I mentioned before? We have a moral obligation, a responsibility by which to become the ultimate role models. When Allah says, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas, you are the best in the community, Allah is talking to you and me. Hmm? You, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas, you are the best in, among the mankind. You, who are you? Liakun al rasul shahidan alaykum. وَتَكُونُوا شُهَدَ عَلَى النَّاسِ Look at this ayah in Surah Al-Hajj, verse number 78. Allah says, وَجَاهِدُ فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِيَادِ هُوَ اجْتَبَاكُمْ وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجٍ مِلَّةَ أَبِيكُمْ إِبْرَاهِيمِ هُوَ سَمَّاكُمْ مُسْلِمِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِ وَفِي هَذَا لِيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ شَهِيدًا عَلَيْكُمْ وَتَكُونُوا شُهَدَ عَلَى النَّاسِ Look at this verse, my God. Verse 78. Struggle in the way of your Lord the way he deserves it. That's a conversation forever. When Allah says, وَجَاهِدُ فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ Oh my God. You and I will have to look around and see what is حَقَّ جِهَادِ When you and I really understand حَقَّ جِهَادِ Not a breath you and I will take other than for Allah. That when we will say, قُلِ نَصَلَاتِ وَنُسُكِ وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ We will understand that. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, Oh Allah, I don't worship you as a businessman for wanting paradise, nor do I worship you as a slave fearful of hell. I worship you because you're worthy of worship. A man comes to Imam Ali alayhi salam and says, Have you seen God? He said, Of course, I worship no God unless I see him. So people say, Amir al-Mu'mineen, God can be seen? He says, Eyes cannot perceive him. But hearts do. And I see nothing but Allah. Now that's deep. When Imam Ali alayhi salam says, I see nothing but Allah. That's quintessential in its essence. You and I should pray in these nights while we're listening to the tragedies of Karbala. While every child is going forward, every adult is going forward, every woman is being challenged, their hijabs are being challenged, they're being dragged in the cities, they are being denied water that tonight, the seventh night of Muharram, the Imam's water was taken away. He was moved and not allowed to be next to the Euphrates. And they ran out of water. So thirst became, we started to fall into their uh, bodies tonight. That by the night, the day of the 10th of Ashura, the 10th of Muharram, they were in extreme thirst, tried to be in a desert without water for three days. And see how difficult that challenge is. The reason the Umayyads prevented them from drinking water was because they knew that Ahl al Bayt and their armies were indomitable, intrepid fighters. And there were lions on. The, on the fields and they were very hard to defeat and the Banu Umayyah were cowards just like Muawiyah was a coward he did not know how to fight Imam Ali Imam Ali, Ali always told him Muawiyah you have a grievance with me come let us settle it you and I 
terrified. Umar bin As, who was the advisor to Muawiyah, Muawiyah says to Umar, you go. Umar says, no, you go. So Muawiyah, he's a very slick guy, you know, with a slick tongue. He says, well, you're my advisor. Prove to me you're something. So Umar goes forward, Umar bin As. He sees Imam Ali alayhi salam pull his sword out. He was terrified, he dropped it, his pants. Because he was so terrified. Imam turns away and says, for a coward like you, who cannot face me, go away. And Imam walks away. That's the power of our blessed Imam. When they fought, you couldn't bring them down. They would take a hundred, one soldier to a hundred. As I mentioned yesterday, Habib bin Ibn Nadair, they say at least 62 enemies, he's, he killed them with his bare hands. Not easy with a sword. It's not like a gun where you shoot. This is one hand at a time. 62 is very tiring. You kill a few, it's tiring. Imagine 62 for a man of his age. That's why they stop water on them. They stop water to weaken them. And tonight was that night. So when you and I examine these things and we look at this great struggle, you and I must not only do this in ritual cycles to say it's important for us to shed tears. But for what? If not to act on it. Allah in the Quran says, قَالَتِ الْعَرَابُ آمَنَّا قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا فَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ وَإِن تُتِيُوا اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ لَا يَلِتْكُمْ مِنْ عَمَالِكُمْ الشَّيْئًا So the Arab dwellers who are the Bedouins of the desert used to say, آمَنَّا We believe because they had just become believers. They had just done shahadatain. قَالَتِ الْعَرَابُ آمَنَّا Allah says to them, say, قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا You don't believe. For faith has not entered your hearts. Rather say, we submit aslamna. Islam is a practical, pragmatic religion. It's not a religion of lip service. It's a religion that is pragmatic. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a grinding path. This is the power of Islam. You know, among all religions in the world, who are the most prayerful people on earth? When it comes to a religion that is set an injunction of salah, Islam. Muslims. Muslims are the most prayerful people on earth. Why? Because Allah has blessed us. In the Quran, Aqim is Salah. I command you to maintain prayers. Our prophets have maintained prayers. Christianity, the original, not the name Christianity, the Islam that Isa salam followed, because Isa was a Muslim, as Allah says in the same verse, وَسَمَّاكُ muslimin min qabl wa fi hada. You were called Muslims before and now. Hmm? Allah says you were all Muslims. Hanifan Musliman, Ibrahim. Millata abikum Ibrahim. The way of your grandfather Ibrahim. Ibrahim. You know you can say, people ask you what religion do you follow? Say I follow the religion of Abraham. That is the same as saying I follow Islam. Because Quran says, Millata abikum Ibrahim. Meaning the name Islam is not new. When you go to school and people say the Abrahamic faith is the youngest of the Abrahamic faiths, raise your hand and say, excuse me, I beg to differ. Islam for humans started with Adam and it was completed with the last messenger. Islam did not start with the Holy Prophet. So I beg to differ. Abraham, Moses, Jesus, all great prophets, Noah, every one of them was a Muslim and the Holy Prophet was the sealer of all prophets. And I'm a Muslim the way Abraham was, the way Adam was. I don't know what you mean any other way. Because it's a poison pill to argue, to say that Islam started 1400 years ago. Like as if this Holy Prophet concocted a new religion. This is a poison pill that is being planted in the minds of the people. Fight it and say, excuse me, I'm sorry. Adam was my first prophet. He was not only the first human being, he was my first prophet. None of you have that. So our Islam started with Adam alayhi salam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We find that our religion has been completed and it came in stages and all prophets were Muslims. But what was their job? Practical. Allah has given us amazing practicality. There's much to discuss on this matter. For you and I must understand that morality and the moral injunctions God has placed upon us, such as salah, is such a critical part of our faith. You find that when Paul is introduced in this modern religion called Christianity, 
You know, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, these are named after people. Christ is a Greek name for Christos. Means the anointed one. Al-Masih, when you translate it into Greek, it becomes Christos. So Christian is actually Greek. It's a Greek name. Church is Kuriakos. It's a Greek word. Isa Jesus never entered a church in his life. He was always in the temple. Please know this. Church came later. Even the cross was nowhere in the life of Isa It came under Constantine the emperor who dreamt of a cross. And it became the symbol of Christianity. By the way, even this crescent that we have as Muslims, it's not an Islamic symbol by the way. It's just a differentiation. Our Prophet never presented crescent to us as a symbol of Islam. Just please know that. Okay? It's just a differentiation. It's just a symbol. What you find then is, Paul, who was a Roman Jew, knew that Jews of the time were very religious in rituals, in practice. He wanted to differentiate it among the Greeks. So he said, practice and religion, meaning worship, is no longer essential for you. Give up prayer. Jesus has died on the cross. In Corinthians, Paul says, were Christ not crucified and risen three days later? Christianity is in vain. It has no meaning. So the vicarious atonement of Isa alayhi salam to die for the sins of mankind is enough as salvation for you to enter paradise and there's no need for you to pray. Although it's good for you to pray, but there's no injunction by which you need to follow on a daily basis how much and when to pray. There is no time. Whereas Quran says, Salatul Mawquta, there is a time for prayers. Aqim as salat lidhuluk al shams ila ghasak al layl. So you maintain prayer from morning, afternoon, and night because this is the command of God. You'll find Muslims are the most prayerful people in the world. If you examine just because of that, you and I have maintained relative balance in our morality for prayer will come in our ways of indecency. That's why Allah says, Inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar wala dhikrullahi akbar. Prayer keeps you away from wrongdoing and evil because it comes in your way. For you and I want to do haram, it's salah time, you have to stop because it's like oil and water. You just can't mix the two. Typically people who do haram stop praying. And sadly people who stop praying start doing haram because now it becomes free fall. God is so merciful that he has enjoined salah upon us and when we go to Karbala, you will see that Imam Hussain lost a good number of his soldiers just at prayer time. Imam Ali did the same thing. He lays the carpet in Safim, and the companion say, Amir al-Mu'mineen, the, so, the uh, Ibn Abbas says to Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, the swords, are, I mean, the arrows are coming. Imam says, he says, but you will get injured. Imam says, if not for this salah, why are we fighting Muawiyah? He wants to eradicate this. This is the foundation of humanity. Salah is where people maintain their balance. You know what salah means? If you ever start a business, you have to have a business plan. And if you ever want to be a successful businessman, you need to know your end and your beginning. And you need to have an exit plan. And you need to understand the purpose and function as to why you're running this business. And if you ever borrowed money from a bank, they're going to hold you to task. That if they understand the very purpose of why you borrowed a dollar from them, they will maintain you within that stance to maintain that vision. Because if they believe in your vision, they will hold you liable to that business plan. Unless you want to change your strategies. Now you will notice in life the same thing. When you and I wake up every morning and sometimes we're lethargic and we're feeling lazy, we don't want to go to school or we don't want to go to work or we don't want to do anything that day, remind yourself as to what the purpose of life is and you will become energized. This is why Imam Ali when he would wake up in the morning, he would put his foot on the ground, he would say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al al azim. There is no authority but God, and I serve him. My God, thank you for giving me one more day to do what? To serve you. That's highly energizing. Now you will notice that if you reiterate your business plan, you will be on track. And every time you reiterate it, what's going to happen is your business plan is going to get more specific, is going to get more focused, and you will be able to articulate your decisions in everything you make based on the business plan. It's, it's logical. It's nothing out of, the, out of the blue. Salah is our moral plan. Every single day, takbiratul ihram, I surrender. Iyaka na'bud wa iyaka nasta'in. You we worship. You we seek from. 
Guide us on the right path. The ones, the path of those you have chosen. Not those who invoke your wrath. And not those who are lost, who have no idea of what is wrong and what is right. Now imagine you and I repeat that five times a day. What a blessing. And when you and I understand that, that we human beings fundamentally are moral beings. If there is one thing you and I will not negotiate, it's morality. When a friend or a spouse or a parent or a child cheats you, you feel very hurt. And if there's one thing we don't like is when a person is bad manners, when a person is bad morals, when they're ruthless, when they're Machiavellian as we say, where the end is not justified by the means. So look how merciful Allah is. He says, I've enjoined upon you, aqim as salah, maintain prayer. Why? Why, my Lord, you want me to pray five times a day? Take time. Reflect on it. Think about it. What is your purpose and function? This is why Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. For it is so practical and pragmatic that when I travel around the world and I stop at different airports, that's one thing I do and I go and examine places of universal worship where Jews, Christians, Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims are all allowed to worship and I watch who's coming to pray. Are the Jews coming? Are the Hindus coming? Are the Buddhists coming? You find they are all named after persons. With all due respect, you can't even name your own religion correctly after a person. Islam is not Ahmadi, it's not Muhammadi. We are followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. You notice? We follow Rasulullah. He is such a pivotal figure that Michael H. Hart has written the most influential people in the history of the human race. Two volumes, two times he has written, twice, two editions. He insists there is no man on earth who has affected the human race at every level of the strata of their existence more than Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi This man, Allah says, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ أَلَمْ نَشْرَحْ لَكَ صَدْرَكَ وَوَضَعْنَا عَنْكَ وَزْرَكَ أَلَّذِي أَنْكَذَ ظَهْرَكَ وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ We elevated your name. Wasn't it heavy when we sent you in Mecca to go and abolish idolatry in the house of Ibrahim? Wasn't it difficult? Hmm? It was very difficult. God said, I strengthen you. أَلَمْ نَشْرَحْ لَكَ صَدْرَكَ It was heavy. We made, we, we allowed you to carry it and we raised your name. Today in the world, from Indonesia, where the day starts roughly from that area, all the way to the end of the earth, 24 hours a day, أَشْحَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ الرَّسُولُ اللَّهِ It's not a coincidence. This is divine. This is God's plan. If you doubt it, study it. Travel and go see. Study religions. You find Judaism is named after Judas. You find Buddhism is named after Buddha. Islam, Allah named it. Allah, al-yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum. When Imam Ali alayhi salam was appointed as the gate to the city of knowledge and perfected the religion, Allah says, al-yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum al-islam adina. Today we have completed our favor upon you and perfected for you your religion. Akmaltu lakum wa atmamtu alaykum. Can you imagine what expression in the Quran? Huh? God is pleased to give you this religion, Al-Islam. Islam Subhanallah. What an honor in the Quran. Allah says, I name this. So when we go back, you'll see that all these other religions, with all due respect, they have a lot of good in them, but they don't hit bullseye. They're far from bullseye. If you examine the pragmatic approach even of Ramadan, fasting for 30 days, amplified socially, it's genius. Just Ramadan, 30 days of fasting is genius. Genius. You want to talk about raising the standard and the bar for humanity to remain upright and moral? كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ We have enjoined fasting upon you like we did before you so that you maintain God consciousness and piety. Can you imagine if we didn't have this? 
I mentioned the other day in my university, people drinking kegs and kegs. And my roommates used to say, how come you don't drink? I said, this is filthy. How come you're not dating girls every day? How come you're not going out running around with girls? I said, my religion has taught me the evils of it. Really? You don't smoke, you don't drink. I said, my religion has taught me this. And I, I, I look at them, not in a condescending way, I look at them with sadness that these poor people who are good have not been guided. They've been left to wander the desert. And they've, be, they've become very impulsive. Whatever glitters, they run towards it. So when you look at them, and you see them lost, Allah says, talk to them. Talk to them. You know, when I travel and people order alcohol, I say, don't order alcohol. They say, why, you're Muslim? I said, it's irrelevant whether I'm Muslim or not. It's bad for you. You know, when I was in a restaurant and somebody ordered some pork, I said, don't, I don't eat pork and I prefer not to on this table. Oh, you're Muslim? I said, it's irrelevant whether I'm Muslim or not. It's bad for you. Consider that. For if I tell you, yes, I'm a Muslim, you'll think it's my religion and I'm now lost in it. But I'm telling you from a practical perspective, pork is bad for you. It leads to trichinosis. It leads to worms in your brain. And keep away from it. It's not an animal designed to be consumed, though people do. Don't drink alcohol. It's not good for you. It inebriates you. It causes cirrhosis of the liver. It destroys your body. I don't understand where you're going with this. It's an addictive substance. Weed, avoid it. All these other smoking, even people are doing this, um, what is electronic cigarettes, vaping. It's been shown to be extremely dangerous for the, for the pancreas, for the liver. It's going to all kinds of destructions. What is the general principle? Allah says, don't take anything that harms you. That is why Allah has made it haram for you. It's not for God to entertain himself to say, don't eat this and eat this and don't eat that. Allah says, when I forbid you something, it's for your own good. And when I allow you to do something, it's for your own good. But we as Muslims have been blessed with fasting, with salah, with deen, with haya, with, with religion. Believe me, I say, when we talk about these youth that will go to get martyred tonight, when I speak about Qasim ibn al-Hassan, and I speak about Aoun and Muhammad, the children of Abdullah ibn Jafar, who are the children of Zainab alayhi salam, and you find Qasim, the son of Imam Hassan tonight, when I speak about them, these are tender teenagers, 13, 14 years old, ready to charge forward. How did they come that way? Because our generation and our spirit and our religion has infused upon us salah, dua, fasting, consciousness, understanding the vision. We understand the purpose of life, unlike dangling in a Pavlovian way where the bell rings and we salivate. No. Allah says, be conscious. You have a purpose in life. So tonight, in this brief explanation, we have an obligation. And Allah says, we have chosen you. Who tabakum? You know when I read this verse, وَجَاهِدُ فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ هُوَ اجْتَبَاكُمْ I started to shake. I read it again. And I read it again. And I read it again. I said, what? God says, I have chosen you. Are you talking to me, Allah? Who was tabakum? Me? Or are you talking about the Prophet or the Imams? Who? Who was tabakum? Allah says, you. I chose you. Me? Hassanin? Allah said, yeah. All of you. The whole human race has been chosen. Wow. We didn't make religion difficult for you. We put religion with laws to make life easy for you. When we told you to be modest, and we told you to maintain prayer, and we told your women to cover themselves, and we told the men to lower their eyes, and to maintain decency, it's not to entertain you. It's for your own good. It brings harmony. It brings tranquility. You look at the world today, it's in disarray where our women are being abused, our men are in disarray because they're not following the deen of Allah and mankind has lost its pathway and now drug abuse is increasing. Fentanyl, which is synthetic drug being manufactured in laboratories, and China is one of the biggest exporters of fentanyl, is a deadly substance. You have one truckload of fentanyl, you can kill the whole United States. Just one truck, you will kill 350 million people. Just one car load. You know, in the trunk, you open the trunk. That's enough to kill the entire population of 350. That's just fentanyl. Then there's something else called car fentanyl, which is a thousand times worse than fentanyl. It's so deadly, just touching it, you may die. You can't even touch it. You have to wear gloves to touch it. We have produced, human race has produced the most lethal substance known to man. For what? to escape the problems of life. 
When the problems of life need to be met with dignity, with honor. الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا. We created death and life to test which of you is best in deeds. How can you be an escapist? The minute we have a problem, go get drunk. The minute you have a problem, go smoke. What's your problem? By doing that, you're adding more problems. How many times I give this example, we are so full of rage and anger, we don't spend time to talk to our children. One of the things you and I need to do as a responsibility in the Quran and in Islam is we must raise our children properly. Tonight when I talk about these children who became martyrs, they were not ordinary children. They were impeccably raised with precision. They were so well monitored. Like Luqman talking to his son, Ya Bunayya, la tushrik billah, inna shirk la dhulmun azim. How many fathers and mothers sit with their children and say, son, daughter, let me teach you this. This is very important for you to know. Hmm? Do we? Not much. We talk about material gains. We talk about how much money we're going to get. What's your next fancy car? I see kids in high school today. Their number one aspiration is to have a pretty girl and have a nice car. If I got those two, success. I got it. It's such a myopic short-term vision thinking. Whereas the child should be thinking of the hereafter, should be thinking of high standards, should be thinking of marrying the best spouse, the one who's going to be the mother of your children, raising them with dignity and honor, and educated, highly educated, successful, not only materially, but spiritually. Do we do that? Luqman is saying to his son, Ya Bunayya, aqim as salah wa amur bil ma'roof, wanhaan il munkar, my son, promote good, forbid evil, and be patient. Look at these advices. Today, we don't raise our children very well with that, with all due respect. We should. I'll give you one example of what we should do to our children. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. When children do well, praise them. But don't overpraise them. Some of our parents are constantly praising them. MashaAllah, my son, SubhanAllah is amazing. I said, okay, I know MashaAllah is amazing. He's your son. Should be amazing. No, MashaAllah is amazing. I said, what's next? Obviously, he's just amazing. What happens is, research shows when you praise your child too much, you create what we call a fixed mindset. Researchers have studied this behavior and say when you praise somebody too much, you create a fixed mindset. What the child does is they revel in this glory. My parents think I'm the best. So I'm already on the mountain and there's no other mountain to climb. So now you challenge this child, they say, no, no, dad, I don't want to do anything more. Why? Because I'm already the best. Like, what is that to do now? M fixed mindset. Growth mindset dictates, praise them, but challenge them next. Praise them, challenge them. If you examine the Quran, it's like that. Allah praises the believers, then he challenges them. He praises, then he challenges them. Ya yul insan, innaka kadihun ila rabbika kadhan famulaqi. All mankind, all mankind, Allah says, Keep struggling upon struggle till you meet your Lord. Meaning Allah praises us. Inna ladina amanu wa amilu salihat lahum jannatun na'een khalidina fiha wa'adullahi haqq They will enter paradise. They are the best. But there is the next challenge. Here's the next challenge. So let's raise our children by challenging them while we praise them. You did great, now here's another one. You did great, now here's another one. What happens is children feel empowered, like wow, and never belittle a child. Never say, you know what, you're so ugly. I've had girls come to cry. They sit with, and they, they cry. I said, why do you have such a low self-esteem? He says, my dad always tells me I'm ugly. I said, oh God, please, maybe your dad didn't mean it. But please don't take it to heart. I said, no, that's my, or a friend says, you know how we sometimes we have a very harsh tongue. We start calling each other terrible names. You know, if somebody doesn't walk right, you give them some names. If somebody doesn't look right, you give them some names. Quran says, don't give each other bad names. Allah says, فَمَنْ لَمْ يَتُوبْ And if you don't stop, you are an oppressor. Don't give each other bad names. لا يسخر قومون من قومين أحسان يكون خيرا منهم وَلَا نِسَاءٌ مِّن نِسَاءٍ عَسَانٍ يَكُنَّ خَيْرًا مِنْهُمْ وَلَا تَلْمِزُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ وَلَا تَنَابَزُوا بِالْأَلْقَابِ بِئْسَ الْإِسْمُ الْفُسُقُ 
بعد الايمان do not give each other bad names when you have got faith and don't laugh at each other perchance you are better than the other women too should not do that and don't find faults in each other why because our self confidence is very sensitive it's very precious it's holy and we need to hold on to it when we belittle a child or when we look down in an incendiary way where we belittle them make them feel bad that child doesn't forget that they take it to heart that's what you really say to me you meant it it may take a lifetime to erase that when i see kids many a times brilliant but they're not doing well failing misbehaving deviant i look at them i said this kid is brilliant This kid is smart. Like why is he like this? Or why is she like this? And then when you sit down with them, you find out somebody's harming them. A boy comes to me and says, "I have no goals in life. I have no desire to do anything." I said, "Why? You're so beautiful. You're so, you know, amazing." I had a boy who was giving him the uniform. I said, "You know, wear this uniform. I want to take a picture." He said, "No, no, I don't want you to take a picture of me." I said, "Why?" He says, "Well, I'm very ugly." I said, "Who told you this? You're so good looking. Who told you this?" "No, you see this brother, look, I have a little pimple right here. See this?" Pimple? I said, "So that pimple makes you ugly?" He says, "Yeah." Said, "How did you get there?" So well, somebody made a comment on that. So somebody noted, "Hey, you got a pimple. Oh, now I'm ugly." This poor kid doesn't want to take a picture. That feeds into your psyche, and the next thing you lose your self-confidence, and the next thing you don't want to study, and the next thing you don't want to speak, next thing you don't want to do anything. Well, Allah says, "Watch tobacco. I chose you." Shaitan says no I'm going to stop that choosing I'm going to belittle him I'm going to have one human being look down on another and I'm going to have this one talk bad about this one so this one will feel defeated then maybe he will never represent Allah properly as khulafa on earth and this way then shaitan says he's my agent I look at those kids I said no absolutely not in fact you are so blessed I'm giving you an assignment They look at me and says, "How are you going to give me an assignment?" I said, "Yeah, I trust you, but I'm only 12 years old." I said, "Even better, watch what you do." 12 year olds, they come to me doing phenomenal things with ideas. Sometimes I sit with them around the, the conference table and say, "Give me ideas. How should this school run?" They come up with ideas, and I'm looking. I said, "Wow, that's a brilliant idea." They feel so empowered. Like, "Why? You're taking our advice?" I said, "Of course. You're important. You're my advisor." She said, "But you're the director." I said, "I'm a nobody, just like you." I'm just older than you. I'm more privileged in age. So what? And watch the child change. I had a boy come to me has no hope. I said to him, "Why?" The more I probed into it, his father never hugged him. Never. He said, "My father has never looked at me and hugged me in my life." He's cold, distant. You know the solution to the problems of life is that a hug a simple hug when your child is talking put your phones away don't look at this and say yes yeah, so what happened in school today put it away look at them in the eye how was your day let them talk come to the eye levels sit with them talk to them it's amazing 5 minutes 10 minutes of that conversation is gold for this child that wow my parents care for me properly This one boy whose father did not hug him, I managed to get them together. It was a daunting, arduous task for the father to even hug his son. Finally, we made him get used to it. And today, his son is very successful in the world. He's doing extremely well with high sense of self-confidence. When Allah says, "Alaykum and fusakum," we have chosen you. You are a gift of God. But let us not be reckless in the way we deal with our children. Let's raise them with intelligence. Let's endow them with knowledge. Two days ago, a young boy comes to me and says, "I'm reading Quran." He came and read Quran yesterday. The parents. I looked at them and said, "Mashallah, such parents who raise their children reading Quran and they recite beautiful Quran. These are the kinds of parents who are going to lead." When we say, when we have children, you know, when we get married, we say, "Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa dhuriyatina qurrata a'yun wa jalna lil muttaqina imama." Look at this du'a. Allah in Surah Al-Furqan, He says, "Look at this du'a. Who are they? They say." Hmm? Our Lord put love hablana min azwajina wa dhurriyatina in our children qurrata a'yun make them cooling to our eyes 
وَجَعَلْنَا إِنْ مَيْكَ اس لِيدَرْز أَمَنْغْ ذَا پَيَسْ There's one thing to be a leader among the people. When you are a leader among the pious, you are the ultimate leader. Salawat Allah Muhammad wa'al Muhammad. In tonight's lecture, brothers, our responsibility is that we must take account that God has gifted us with the best religion. When I travel the world and people ask me questions, I discuss with them. Sometimes philosophers will ask me, how do you know that? Like the argument of evil. I have sat with PhDs in theology. They look at me and say, where did you get these answers from? How do you know this? We are PhDs. We've written theses on these. How do you have such clarity in what you say? I said, my Quran guides me. My prophet guides me. My Ahlul Bayt guide me. They taught me how to look at this. Our teachers, our ulama, our fuqaha, our great scholars have expounded on them and taught us that this is the way by which we're going to avoid the, uh, the traps of this world. We're gifted. So please, all of us, in these nights, if we're going to talk about Qasim and we're going to look at Ali Akbar, who talked to his father with such clarity, that his father is telling him, Oh Ali, what do you think? He said, let us go. If this is where truth lies, then let us go. He said, how blessed I am to have a son like you. We must raise children like that. Let's educate our children morally, please. Today I've seen parents who don't care. Just my son, you just become rich and powerful and get educated. I don't care what you do with the morality. This is a problem. You, we as parents have a moral responsibility to educate our children with the best education academically in terms of the secular education, but spiritual, religious education is pivotal, extremely important. If our children don't have good morals, we haven't succeeded. I don't care if they become the best neurosurgeons. Yesterday I was reading the newspaper, one of the world-renowned neurosurgeons on the front page of the newspaper, very, very, and the way he talks with such filth, you think this man is the top neurosurgeon surgeon in the one of the best in the southern hemisphere and his tongue is so harsh and vile and he's got no akhlaq you know what you don't feel like listening to this, such a person you may be good with the scalpel but if you've got no ethics and morality by which to follow with all due respect it's very hard to respect such people you and I, when we talk about Ahlul Bayt, when we talk about Imam Hussein alayhi salam, when we talk about Zainab alayhi salam, when we talk with his family, Fatima al Zahra, look at their qualities. Believe me, all my life, I've been researching that. And every time I read great, great sages in the world, I say, let me compare them with this. No comparison. Allah says, فَمَنْ يَمْشِي مُكِبًّا عَلَى وَجْهِهِ أَهْدَى أَمَّنْ يَمْشِي سَوِيًّا عَلَى صِرَاطِ مُسْتَقِيمٍ Can the one who puts his face on the ground groveling on earth, equivalent to the one who's upright and in the right path of God, are they equal? فَمَنْ يَمْشِي مُكِبًّا عَلَى وَجْهِهِ أَهْدَى أَمَّنْ يَمْشِي سَوِيًّا عَلَى صِرَاطِ مُسْتَقِيمٍ No. The choice is yours and mine. Allah says, I talk to you, and I have left you with your free will, and you will decide your own destiny. <inaudible> we have guided you to the right path, whether you are grateful or ungrateful. Please, and I, I sincerely say to all of us, let's seek God's guidance. Tomorrow I'll talk about the power of prayer, and the power of reflection, and the power of the mind. Simple examples. You find that when you and I take time to reflect, the religion of Islam, the five daily prayers, are what we call refreshments. Refreshing the mind. I always used to say, in my busy schedule during the day, I am the busiest in the afternoon during the hard time. Usually the phones are ringing, I've got a lineup of meetings, it's just insanity. I look at the time, it's salat time. Now what do you do? He says, well, time to pray. And many times, Whenever I would go to pray, sometimes I would say to Allah, Oh Allah, there's Fajr which is 2, Dhuhr Asr which is 8, Maghrib Isha which is 7. Couldn't Dhuhr Asr, I mean, could be 2 only, you know? I could be fast, you don't get back to my work. Allah says, no, not enough for you. You need 8 rakah. You need to mellow out. You need to slow down. What are you doing? Why are you running? Where are you running to? Oh God, I've got a million. Allah says, take it easy. Reflect. The Prophet said one hour of reflection is better than a thousand rakah of nightly prayers. Why? Reflection. Give you a simple example. 
Find two, uh, two people decide to challenge each other and who could cut more trees down. So both took an ax and they challenged. They started chopping trees. One of them, every 45 minutes, would stop for 15 minutes. The other one kept chopping. Busy chopping trees to win the game. Seven hours passes by, they counted the trees. SubhanAllah, the one who took the 15 minute break cut more trees. You would think impossible, based on time and labor and how much time you put in. This person who didn't stop should have cut more trees. So the other one who won was asked by the one who lost, how did you do it? What were you doing for the 15 minutes? He said, I sharpened my axe and you forgot to do that. So your axe was getting blunter in time and you were becoming less productive. So when you do salah, it's sharpening your axe. You produce more. And research shows, you know, many times I'm busy, I'm wearing my suit, I'm wearing my garb, and it's time to go to pray. So, okay, I gotta take my shoes off, gotta take my socks off, I have to do my wudu. Like, I took a bath this morning, I'm pretty clean. I mean, God, why not just accept me in prayer without wudu? You know, subhanAllah, we question this. Allah says, I have given you rules and regulations for a reason. And it's interesting, in modern times, psychologists have studied this fact. They say when you hear a lie, it is very disturbing. If you ever hear a lie, somebody lies to you, it's very disturbing. When you hear bad news, it's very disturbing. Human nature, our psyche is disturbed. Researchers show that the minute you wash your hands, you forget it. Now I'm not saying the reason we have to do wudu is for that, but look at the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That ruku is seeking permission to go to sujood. Sujood, the two sujoods are so meaningful. Allah says, Minha khalaqnakum, wa fiha nu'idukum, wa minha nukhrijukum taratan ukhra. From it you were created, to it you will return, and from it you will be raised. That is why when we do sujood, we use turba. Why do we use turba? It's in the Quran, it's in the sunnah of Rasulullah, that when you do sujood, make sure there's earth between you and your sujood. Because from it you were created, to it you will return, and from it you will be raised. And no Muslim does any salah that has sujood less than two or more than two. That's the reason. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. I'm spelling some of these salient realities you and I live by, that you and I may have shrugged our shoulders towards to say, ah, what is this religion, Islam? Allah says, وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجٍ We didn't make this religion difficult for you. We have placed it for you to make it easy to raise good children, to raise good generations. You know, whenever I go to weddings and I'm reciting the nikah, you know the most, what I pay the most attention to are the parents of the children who are getting married. No one beams more than the parents because they have reached a stage they're letting go of their responsibilities, relatively speaking. But it's not easy to raise children till marriage. It's not easy to give them towards modesty. It's not easy to find the right spouse. It's a difficult task. But how blessed are the parents when they raise their children properly. So when we take our children and we train them and we educate them, we monitor them, we nurture them, we protect them and we guide them and we, and we do all of the above, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards us much. So in this context, I want us to understand that in Karbala, Imam Hussein alayhi salam had little nephews. Zainab alayhi salam's children were there. As you know, Aun and Muhammad were teenagers. And they were, did not leave with Imam Hussein from Medina. When Imam Hussein alayhi salam was leaving Mecca to go to Kufa, Abdullah ibn Jafar meets him and advises the Imam not to go. Imam says, no, I am going. So then Abdullah says, in that case, and you don't want me to join you because he wanted to join Imam Hussein. Imam says, no, you must remain behind. You have an obligation. He says, then take my two sons, Aun and Muhammad, and I want to sacrifice them for you to protect you. So Aun and Muhammad were both, as you know, Abdullah ibn Jafar Tayyar. Jafar is called at Tayyar, whose father was killed in the Battle of Mu'ta, whose both arms were cut, and therefore the Prophet stated that he has been given wings. That's why it's called Tayyar. Jafar Tayyar. This is his son, Abdullah, who is the husband of Zainab alayhi salam, and he now gives these two sons to Imam Hussein, and these two young boys move with Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And the other son that Imam was raising was Imam Hassan's young son, whose name was Qasim. 
Qasim was also a teenager, a young, tender teenager, and the Imam was raising him too because Imam Hassan was poisoned 10 years prior to Karbala. What you find is that Qasim is also joining and they're all in Karbala. Quick history, when the battle of Karbala started, usually in any battle in the Prophet's time, up to Karbala, Ahlul Bayt, the Banu Hashim, were always the first ones to go fight. In the battle of Badr, in the battle of Uhud, in the battle of Khandaq, you will see the Imam and the Prophet and ban the Banu Hashim were always on the front lines fighting first. Then the companions would follow. In Karbala, it was reversed because they knew that they will be annihilated, so the Imam remains to the end. Hence, he sends the companions first. So all the companions have been martyred. Most of them have been martyred. That they have all, their bodies have been strewn. Imam is pulling them back to the tent. These little youth who are standing eager now to be part of that, that great sacrifice. Now I want you to understand, this is a mother now, Zainab. Where do I start with Zainab? Where do I start talking about Zainab? When I go to her grave in Syria, when I touch her sarcophagus, I say, Zainab, you are the sky of women. You are the in, in, indomitable woman. You are that woman who is so powerful. They say when she used to talk, people thought it is Ali ibn Abi Talib talking. Her language, her speech, her eloquence was like Imam Ali salam. And Imam Ali salam was known to be one of the most eloquent human beings on earth. She's a child. She's four years old. She's sitting on the lap of her father. Listen to the hikmah of Zainab. These are, her, these are her sons. She says, Baba, do you love Allah? Imam Ali salam says, yes, I love Allah. She says, Baba, do you love me? He says, yes, my daughter, I love you. She says, Baba, how can you love me when you love Allah? For when you love Allah, there is no room. This is the wisdom she had, four years old. She's now an older woman, she's a mother. She's in Karbala. <laughs> and she witnessed every little event she was watching. My God. They say, Rabab, the wife of Imam Hussein, was watching. Umm Farwa was there, some say, watching. These were the wives of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Zainab is watching. So Imam Ali alayhi salam replies to Zainab. She said, he said, I love you because Allah loves you. That's why I can love you. Look at the conversation of a father to a daughter. It's so beautiful, so deep. Yet this blessed Imam, while he was sitting on his lap, knew that there will come a time when she will be dragged city to city <laughs> and she will be brought in front of tyrants to have to face when she's the princess of the Holy Prophet. She says to her son, my son, I will not be happy until you give this time. She said, our uncle is not allowing us. Which mother? would send her sons like that. Except the one who has made a deal with Allah to give. So she gives. They say, Aun and Muhammad, they go to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Imam says, you are young, you are tender. How can I send you to the front lines? They said, uncle, give us the power, please. Give us the authority. Give us the permission so we can go forward and do what we can do little. So we get this status with you. This is the kind of children you and I need to raise. Aoun and Muhammad were young. They said when they climbed up the horses, they were young, but they were chanting with such pride and valor, with their heavy swords wielding at the enemy, striking, and the Imam is watching these two beautiful moons fighting. They say even when Qasim went forward and he seeks permission, the Imam refuses to give him permission. He had a ta'weez. He opens up the ta'weez and there's a letter by Imam Hassan. He said, oh my brother Hussein, I will not be present with you in Karbala, in this place of tragedy, but take this son of mine as my representative and do not forbid him from doing what he wants to do. Imam says, how can I say no to you Qasim? 
They say Azim was so young, he wasn't a soldier. Even when he went to fight, he was wearing sandals and the sandal straps were hanging. Imam puts him on the horse. Can you imagine an uncle having to do this at the last minute when all have died and these young youth want to now achieve martyrdom? And the Imam watches this. That while they are fighting, and when they are struck, all of them shrieked out, said, Ya Ammu, they called their uncle. Imam charges towards them, but it's too late, for they both were killed. Aun and Muhammad were struck. But when they were fighting, Umar ibn Sa'ad said, Who are these youth? They look like Ali ibn Abi Talib in the young age. He says, This is the house of Banu Hashim. This is how they are. They fought, they killed, and then they were killed. Qasim, the same thing. Qasim was struck. He falls off his horse, and he gets dragged on his horse. And Imam carries him, and his body is completely broken. And the mothers are watching. The mothers are watching. Historians say that when the Imam comes back with the bodies of these three, these beautiful nafs of Zakiya, Imam enters the tent of Zainab. And you know what Zainab was doing? She was doing sujood. She was thanking Allah. <laughs> and saying to Allah, thank you for giving me this opportunity to give my two sons for this great tragedy. Allah, 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 my brothers, inshallah we will recite a short dua. Ilahi, bi akhassi sifatik, wa bi izzi jalalik, wa bi azamati asmaik, wa bi wa bi ismati anbiyaik, wa bi nuri awliyaik, wa bi dami shuhadaik, wa bi midadi ulamaik, wa bi duaai sulhaik. وبمناجاتي فقرائك نسألك زيادة في العلم وصحة في الجسم وطولا في العمر في طاعتك وساعة في الرزق وساعة في الرزق وتوبة قبل الموت وراحة عند الموت ومغفرة بعد الموت ونورا في القبر ونجاة من النار ودخول الجنة وعافية من كل بلاء الدنيا وعذاب الآخرة بحق محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين O oh Allah In the name of your most special attributes the glory of your majesty the greatness of your names the purity of your prophets the light of your near friends the blood of your martyrs the path of your scholars the prayers of your upright servants the sincere prayers of your devoted servants we beg you for more knowledge Amin. Firmness of body. Amin. Long life to worship you. Amin. Possession of wealth. Amin. Repentance before death. Amin. Tranquility at the time of death. Amin. Tranquility at the time of death. Salvation after death. Peace in the grave. Deliverance from hell. Amin. Entrance into paradise. Protection from the trials and tribulations of this world and the punishment of the hereafter. For the sake of Muhammad and his pure chaste and infallible family. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad.
السلام عليك يا وارث آدم صفوة الله السلام عليك يا وارث نوح النبي الله السلام عليك يا وارث إبراهيم خليل الله السلام عليك يا وارث موسى كليم الله السلام عليك يا وارث عيسى روح الله السلام عليك يا وارث محمد حبيب الله السلام عليك يا وارث أمير المؤمنين ولي الله السلام عليك يا ابن محمد المصطفى السلام عليك يا ابن علي المرتضى السلام عليك يا ابن فاطمة الزهراء عليك السلام السلام عليك يا ابن خديجة الكبرى السلام عليك يا ثار الله وابن ثاره والوتر الموتور أشهد أنك قد قمت الصلاة وآتيت الزكاة وأمرت بالمعروف ونهيت عن المنكر وأطعت الله ورسوله حتى أتاك اليقين فلعن الله أمة قبلت ولعن الله أمة ظلمت ولعن الله أمة سمعت بذلك فرضيت به يا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله أشهد أنك كنت نورا في الأصلاب الشامخة والأرحام المطهرة لم تنجسك الجاهلية بأنجاسها ولم تلبسك من مذله المات ثيابها وأشهد أنك من دعائم الدين وأركان المؤمنين وأشهد أنك إمام البر الطبي الرضي الزكي الهادي المهدي وأشهد أن الأئمة بولدك كلمة الطهرة وأعلام الهدى والعروة الوثقى والحجة على أهل الدنيا وأشهد الله وملائكته وأنبياءه ورسله أني بكم مؤمن وبيابكم موقن بشرائع ديني وخواتيمي عملي وقلبي لقلبكم سن وأمري لأمركم متبع صلوات الله عليكم وعلى
حصلت حرمك وأتيت إلى مشهدك أسأل الله بالشأن الذي لك عنده وبالمحل الذي لك لدي أن يصلي على محمد وآل محمد وأن يجعلني معكم في الدنيا والآخرة السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين ورحمة الله وبركاته وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآل محمد